Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Ryan, Vice President <clears throat> and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you this evening to the second episode of our new series, Curator Confidential, a live virtual program presented each Tuesday evening exclusively for members and other supporters of our organization. I hope that you are safe and healthy as you watch this at home, and I hope that we will see you back at New York Historical as soon as it is open, it, it, as soon as it is safe for us to reopen our doors. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to thank all of our trustees, our Chairman's Council, and all of our members and other donors for your generosity. We can only continue to make history matter with your ongoing support. I know that there are many causes vying for your philanthropy, so we are deeply grateful to have you as part of our family. So before I begin my remarks, um, a bit of housekeeping. Tonight's program will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during my remarks. Please use the Q&A uh, function and not the chat function. The chat function will be disabled. So if you wanna ask questions, submit them via the Q&A function. So let me now dive into my remarks. Uh, I'm gonna share with you some observations on what is probably our best known document. Um, Certainly, I can't. I don't know of any other thing, any other item in our collection, which has been so frequently reprinted <clears throat> as John Winthrop's model of Christian charity. Um, it is. It is. It has been anthologized. It appears in history and literature anthologies of American studies. Um, it's known almost as a founding document of this country. So I'm gonna do two things tonight with this text. I'm gonna sketch sort of a general context of the history of the transmission of the text and its celebration in the 20th century. And then secondly, I'm gonna invite you to take a close look at the actual document with me to try to understand better exactly what it is that we're looking at. So first, some remarks on American exceptionalism. And in thinking about ways in which to do this very briefly, um, I was casting about for options when all of a sudden I came across a column written in the Washington Post by this man. Oh, there he is, Joe Scarborough. Uh, so most of you will know uh, Joe Scarborough. Some of you will watch him religiously and some of you will avoid him religiously. But he wrote a column in the, in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago on American exceptionalism. And I wanna just read a little, oops, that. I wanna just read a little bit of that for you. Joe writes, I believe in American exceptionalism and think those who don't must be so blinded by their own prejudices that they can't see the facts right in front of them. The United States military might and economic prowess remain unrivaled. America's cultural influence and soft power remain enormous, even with the most inward looking president in over a century sitting in the White House. It should also surprise no one that a country born in the age of the enlightenment would thrive so mightily in science, medicine and technology. And he goes on to do a roll call of famous people, inventors, politicians, uh, businessmen, people who have basically built this country and all of the things that we've achieved. However, it's the first sentence of uh, Scarborough's column that struck me. That is to say, if you don't believe in American exceptionalism, you probably aren't American. It is, this is an article of faith that goes so deep uh, and so, it's so basic to what it means to be an American uh, that everyone by virtue of being born here and raised here must surely, surely accept that. Um, 
there are many ways of representing American exceptionalism. In the 19th century, um, it was often the image of providence or the, the figure of providence guiding a chosen people. Uh, it's deliberately biblical, um, emphasizing the special providence of election that would have appealed to a largely Protestant citizenry. Um, in an exhibition that you will see when we reopen on the US census, <clears throat> there is a large <clears throat> reproduction of a Thomas Gast painting from the late 19th century, showing an enormous angel striding across the continent, leading settlers to settle the West, um, thus emphasizing America's special providence and manifest destiny in settling the country. The image, however, of a city on the hill has come to dominate discussions of, of American exceptionalism in the 20th century. And I thought before we turn to that, it might be useful just to, just to look at quickly the source of City on the Hill, which is, oops, which is <clears throat> the parable of salt and light from the beginning part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. And Jesus says to his disciples, he's teaching them, he's just recited the, uh, the, his new model of morality, this morality that extols the poverty, meekness, humility, peacemakers, etc. And he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be, be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That I think is the source where John Winthrop, uh, who was not a minister, but was learned in the scriptures, undoubtedly found it. The man who actually went past scripture uh, and found the source as John, in John Winthrop was, of course, Ronald Reagan, the great communicator, and his speech writers, uh, uh, especially Ken Kachikian, who I think is the one who really latches on to the Winthrop text. So this, <clears throat> this from very early 1980, Reagan says, I have quoted John Winthrop's words more than once on this campaign trail this year, for I believe that Americans in 1980 are every bit as committed to that vision of a shining city on a hill as were those long ago. Um, this is, um, this is rather extraordinary because what Reagan tells us is that Reagan has been using this, the Republicans have been using this uh, as a sort of a battering ram against Jimmy Carter in the, uh, all of the debates and conversation leading up to the elections in 1980. So it's become a mantra, a leitmotif for Ronald Reagan. And he recurs to it again at the very end of his career in the White House, his farewell address, which is really quite moving. And it sort of underscores Reagan's extraordinary talent at bringing everything together in this image of a nation, one people. He says, I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace, a city with three ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get there. That's how I saw it and still see it. Um, this is a kind of remarkable image in many ways. It has very little to do with the city described in Matthew 13, 15, 
Um, it is, however, the evocation of an image that lasts and has an enormous resonance. Presidents continue to, uh, to, to, to recite this uh, over and over again. So how, how does this happen? How does it come to pass <clears throat> that this text by John Winthrop, uh, Christian Charity, a model here up, how does it come to pass that this relatively obscure document comes to play such an outsized role in American political discourse and in American thinking about itself? That, it turns out, is a really good question. And that's what I want to turn to briefly right now. So from 1630 to 1806, you can't find a mention of this document. It exists nowhere. No one has seen it. Um, none of the early literature uh, from, um, from, from Puritan America references it. Um, Cotton Mather, who certainly read everything that was available to him, was not aware of it in his Magnalia Christiana. The first time this document appears, um, it appears on a register uh, of, of incoming gifts at the New York Historical Society two years after we were open. Um, uh, and it appears at the very bottom, if you can see on your screen, very the very bottom of the screen um, right here, uh, a model, uh, a model of Christian charity, blah, 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 by John Winthrop. The, the books above it are, you know, they're, they're a, a, a potpourri of literature written by Puritans and by English about New England. It's almost as if this document were just thrown in at the very end of this gift. This is a gift made by the Winthrop family here in New York. The bulk of John Winthrop's papers, however, are at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Whence, that's the place that publishes the document for the first time in 1838. It appears in one volume. The, the sermon uh, is a mere 16, 17 pages. It's very short. Um, and that's it. Uh, that's it really until the 20th century. And then indeed, really until the third quarter of the 20th century. So this is not a document that has been there from the beginning. This is something that was discovered and purposely resuscitated for various purposes. How did this happen? It's a really interesting story. For that, we have to turn to Harvard and the figure of Perry Miller, probably the most distinguished historian of colonial New England uh, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, Perry Miller, I'm, I'm not gonna talk a lot about him. He's a really interesting character. He's born in Chicago in 1905, comes of age in the roaring 20s, uh, enrolls at the University of Chicago, uh, leaves it very quickly, doesn't graduate, and starts roaming around the world, winds up in Africa, and he sees on, on, on a dock somewhere in West Africa, piles of American goods coming in. And at that point, something flashes. He has his eureka moment. He thinks, how does this happen? How can it happen that that country way across the Atlantic could be sending things over here? How could America have become so great, so far flung? So whatever uh, you know, an adolescent mind would, would be impressed with. Uh, at that point, he, and he's, he's retold this story many times, he, he, he got his calling. That was, that was the, the moment at which he decided that his life's occupation would be trying to understand the origins of America, how and, and in so doing, understand how America came to be what it was when he discovered it in Africa in the 1920s. Well, Miller returned to Chicago, not only got an undergraduate degree, got a PhD, quickly went off to Harvard. 
where he spent the rest of his life studying Puritan literature uh, and produced volume after volume after volume on it. But, but towards the end of his life, Miller had a very special project. He was going to do a monumental history of his, of his period. He was going to do a multi-volume work that would be in great detail, that, that would begin at the very beginning and trace, trace the narrative of the American story the way it should be traced. To do that, he felt he needed a jumping off point. He needed something early on to set the stage, a document, an episode, something that in itself would summarize or prefigure what America would become. He's looking, in other words, for an acorn, the acorn out of which would grow the mighty oak that would be America. And he comes across it in John Winthrop. An unflattering painting of John Winthrop, but there you have it. That's all that I could find for you. John Winthrop, uh, I should just say in passing, um, is an educated lawyer, a man of a man of parts, as they would say at that time, um, a man of substance. Uh, he was uh, reasonably well to do. Um, the band of Puritans that he led over from from England were also reasonably well to do in contrast with the pilgrims who had arrived earlier from the Netherlands, uh, who were uh, rather impoverished and a scrappy bunch. Uh, the difference between the Puritans and the Pilgrims is that the Puritans never really break with the Church of England. They continue to recognize the authority of the king as head of the Church of England. The Pilgrims renounced all that, and that's why they had to leave uh, England for, for the Netherlands first, and then from the Netherlands to the New World. So, uh, the text. So here's, here's the text, uh, the text, Winthrop's text. He says, we shall find that the God of Israel is among us when 10 of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and, a, and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, may the Lord make of it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all the people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present, his present from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. So what, what did Winthrop see in this? Um, Winthrop, what did, what did Perry Miller see in this? He saw in this something that was very important to him in the context of the 1950s, when there's a lot of talk among certain in certain circles about the uh, the 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 American fall from 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 election, the fact that America had become too materialistic, become too greedy, too individualistic, um, the sense of a whole, the sense of community, the sense of Christian charity which bound us at the beginning has ceased to bind us today. And so what, what Miller wanted to do was to make this model of Christian charity a kind of jumping off point for a narrative that would in effect help restore America to its rightful origins as a country founded literally in Christian charity. There's no triumphalism. There's, not, there's nothing to do with Ronald Reagan's shining city on the hill, nothing to do with Joe Scarborough's litany of inventors and politicians, but everything to do with Christian charity, with men loving each other, working together to build a community where the good of the whole takes precedent over the good of the individual. What did Ronald Reagan see in this? I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I think for Reagan, this was appealing during the Cold War because the Cold War was not only uh, a contest of arms and military might, 
and economic prowess, it's also a contest of values. Um, in invoking John Winthrop, he's invoking a city on a hill, which is the epitome of morality and moral value. And that I think is the attraction of Winthrop's sermon to Reagan and to indeed all succeeding presidents who have cited it. I don't know whether the current president has. I have not had time to sort through the collected tweets of Donald Trump. Um, at some point, maybe somebody will do that, and maybe he himself will also have discovered the text. So now I want to, now that we've sort of set the stage, I want to just look at the source. So this is, this is the actual document itself that we're talking about. This is what you see when you open it up. It is, there is no, there is no name on it. There is no date. There is no place. There is no information about it, just a title. Um, the other thing to note about it, um, if you know anything about 17th century paleography, is that this is in a this is in a secretarial hand. This is clearly a copy made for Winthrop or whomever by a copyist. Um, it's what we would call a fair copy. So it's not it's not the original text. So um, this text comes this, this sermon comes wrapped in this. So this, it turns out, from my opinion, is the source of a lot of mischief and misleading information about the document. Uh, I know you probably can't read that, but let me just note one thing that should be obvious. The handwriting here is very different from the handwriting you just saw. Two very different scripts. This actually is an 18th century script. Um, that's very clear if you worked with any of these, any historical documents from the period at all. Um, I'm now going to show you what this says. And we're gonna walk through it very quickly because my time is running out. A model of Christian charity written on board the Arabella on the Atlantic Ocean by the Honorable John Winthrop Esquire in his passage with a great company of religious people, uh, <clears throat> of which Christian tribes he was, brave leader and famous governor from a grant of Great Britain to New England in the North America, Anno 1630. Well, I, you know, that, that rapper has been basically taken at face value by generations of historians and scholars. Um, I don't know how, how we would authenticate it. I don't know how we would authenticate anything it says. Um, how do we, we, we know, we know, we, we pretty much know for certain that it was not written on board the Arabella. We know pretty much for certain it was written in England prior to leaving. Whether Winthrop read it on, on board the Arabella, uh, we have no idea. But when you notice that, which may be fiction, and you string that together with, in his passage with a great company of religious people of which Christian tribes an allusion to the tribes of Israel, chosen people. He was the brave leader and famous, noted, governor from a grant of Great Britain to New England into the North America. So there's, what I see when I read that is a narrative in embryo. Somebody wants us to interpret this document in a certain way. And there's one point in the document that helps me make my case. So this is it. Just before he gets to the city on the hill, um, 
he talks about uh, this in relation to New England is in the text, printed New England. And you can see New England written here, but scratched out underneath that is Massachusetts. Um, that's interesting. So somebody, somebody, possibly the person who wrote the text for the wrapper, wanted to change one for the other. And the question is, why? Why scratch out Massachusetts for New England? Uh, that's really an interesting question, it turns out. And I think there's no scholarly literature on this that I've encountered yet. So finally, yes, so here it is. <clears throat> so may the Lord make it like that of New England, where it originally read, make it like that of Massachusetts. So we're left with questions. Massachusetts, New England, written on board the, Arbe the Arbella, brave leader and famous governor, Honorable John Winthrop Esquire, great company of religious people. So all of this tells me that we are probably looking at an interpolation uh, an intervention, as they say today in scholarship, by someone after Winthrop in the 18th century, who is trying to make this document into something bigger than perhaps what it was. Why? I can't tell you. <clears throat> I think more work would need to be done on that. But certainly, um, certainly, uh, it's it's a series of question marks, and I'm afraid that's probably all I can leave you with. Um, but if I've left you with nothing other than questions, I've at least demonstrated why what we do here at the New York Historical Society is important. Because we try to make, we try to interrogate documents, we interrogate artifacts, we try to make artifacts speak and make documents speak. And it's only through working with them closely that, uh, that documents uh, are made to work. So I want to remind you too that um, remind you too to submit your questions on Q and A, and I'm happy to take them right now. So let me put on me specs and see what we have. Uh, <clears throat> one question. People sometimes claim that virtues like charitable giving are uniquely American, yet Winthrop and his fellow passengers were not yet American when he wrote this. Didn't he import English values that took root here? Um, I think Winthrop, um, Winthrop probably wouldn't dissent from that, but I do think that for Winthrop, these are Christian values. And of course, charity towards one, one's fellow man is very much um, a fundamental part of the gospel of Jesus. So I would say in this particular case, um, it's less English than it is Christian. And of course, for Puritans, the biblical foundation of their religion was paramount. Um, the Puritans uh, dissented from the Church of England uh, on this, on, 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 with the critique that it simply wasn't reformed enough. So I think, I think the answer is Christianity in this one and not so much English. Uh, next question, what distinguishes a fair copy? How would you know it from a copyist? Well, a fair copy is what a copyist makes. And you can tell a fair copy because they're usually incredibly neat they conform to certain secretarial hands. So, you know, once upon a time when people were taught how to do cursive, uh, people did cursive in a certain way. Uh, back in the day before there were typewriters and computers, uh, people learned all kinds of different cursives for different functions. So if you were creating legal documents, you had one kind of uh, secretarial hand. If you had political documents, you might have others. Uh, copyists would make uh, 
would amanuensis would make documents from amanuensis for their masters, etc. So it's pretty straightforward what a what a fair copy is. It's easy. It's easy to 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 tell them because there's nothing rushed or hurried about them. To whom was Winthrop addressing uh, his address? Um, how long ago? Uh, another question. So he was addressing, I mean, we think he was addressing it to perhaps the band that accompanied him in 1630 to Massachusetts. There is, and I didn't, I didn't want to raise this, but I'm going to raise it now. I don't think it's even clear that John Winthrop wrote this or that he delivered it. John Winthrop is a lawyer. He's not a minister. There were ministers on board the Arbella. There were ministers part of the first settlement uh, in, of Mass Bay Colony. That was not the case with the Pilgrims. There were no ministers with the Pilgrims. John Bradford, William Bradford and company were their own ministers and they wouldn't get ministers for a while. So it's not clear in my mind that Winthrop is even necessarily the author. In saying that, I'm out on a limb, uh, but that's something to think about uh, as you're thinking about documents like this historically. How long ago was the erased Massachusetts identified? Actually, quite recently. I mean, people have seen it, but it's only relatively recently that people have come to comment on it. Um, you know, some of the reasons for the change may have to do with arcane disputes between the Mass Bay Colony and the congregations there and the Plymouth, Col Plymouth and Salem colonies and the congregations there. Uh, substituting New England for Massachusetts gives John Winthrop, um, as it were, <clears throat> a much bigger scope than just Massachusetts. Um, it gives him all of what became New England by the 18th century. The term New England is used in the 17th century and it's used in travel literature, it's used by people who are coming back from, from the New World, um, but it's used vaguely. Uh, here I think that there really is a deliberate attempt to create a, a domain, a space for Winthrop's governance that transcends mere Massachusetts. Uh, question, what do you think would be the public's perception of Winthrop today? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of people that rise to the defense of, of Puritans or Puritanism. Um, I happen to be one of them. Who, who would rise in their defense. So I'm not sure how I can really answer that, except to note that Winthrop set up a, a colony and equipped it well, so that by 1640, uh, <clears throat> it was already printing its own works. Maybe some of you saw the, the Massachusetts Bay Psalter, the first book printed in America, well, that came out largely due to the early efforts of John Winthrop and his group. Uh, John Winthrop um, will appear from time to time as a founding father in some of the earlier anthologies and textbook histories of America. So I think the public's perception of Winthrop as a founder shaped by the narrative that the rapper puts on the piece uh, probably would stand him in good stead. Um, certainly the very word Puritan uh, conjures up images of a dour and pessimistic and um, overly tender conscious group of people. Um, but the Puritans were a remarkably bright, accomplished, smart, motivated uh, group. Uh, that really deserve more attention, uh, better attention anyway. How do we know it was probably written in England before they left? Because there's, in it, there's internal evidence 
based on what this group was doing in England at the time just before they left. You'll have to take my word for it, but that's, I think, the balance of historical opinion. Um, there are references uh, later in the sermon to um, events, places that, uh, that could only have come from a, from, a, from a text written in England. Had the founding fathers ever heard of John Winthrop? Well, I don't think so. Um, I mean, had they heard of him? They may have heard of him. Um, certainly he had standing as somebody who was an early colonist, but I don't, he doesn't really loom large. I don't know the person, the person whose correspondence uh, one would check, of course, would be John Adams. Uh, I would imagine if anyone knew about John Winthrop, John uh, Adams would have known. Whether it meant anything to Adams is a better question. And I, and then that score, I can't answer. I don't think so, but, um, but I, but, but I couldn't say for sure. So we have another question. Agreed that charity is a Judeo-Christian value, though expressed here in English terms. That makes the case for this text as a source of American exceptionalism more tenuous, uh, doesn't it? Um, well, I, the, the text is adopted. So there's nothing intrinsic in the text that would particularly mark it out as a source or a reference point or a launch point for thinking about American exceptionalism or a metaphor for American exceptionalism. Um, uh, it's, it's, bec it's because of its history of interpretation, of being interpreted in the second half of the 20th century that it becomes um, a metaphor for American exceptionalism. And if you believe, as many people do, that the beginning of the story always contains the seeds of what unfolds later on, then it's the perfect beginning in a certain context for the American story, because it tells of or it urges <clears throat> people to come together and it's, it, Winthrop lays it out. I mean, it's a, it's basically doing what the Sermon on the Mount does, uh, exhorting his followers, exhorting Puritans to love each other, to take care of each other, not to be selfish, not to bicker, uh, because, and, and this is really what's interesting about that piece, because we will be seen. If we fail, we're gonna be seen. People are gonna know that we have failed. And that for Winthrop makes him very anxious. And that makes his followers anxious too. This idea of being seen as less than what you think you are, of uh, being taken down a notch in the eyes of men. That was very important to Winthrop and very important to Puritans. Um, that too alludes vaguely to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and Christ's exhortation not to hide your light under a bushel but for the salt not to lose its taste. Um, so I hope that that's a better answer, some, something of an answer to that question. What else does the New York Historical Society have in its collection related to John Winthrop? We have books um, that came from the family. Um, we have scattered things um, by Winthrop, but in terms of manuscripts, um, this is it. As I say, most of Winthrop's material at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, a related question, does New York Historical Society have an extensive collection of 17th century Puritan literature or the like? The answer is yes. Um, we have quite a bit and we were happy to actually begin to get some of it out during the Harry Potter show when the whole topic of magic and witchcraft came up and we were able to get out a lot of the literature that we have on the Salem witch trials and on the, the, the whole um, topic of witchcraft and witchery 
in the 17th century. It's unfair to sort of brand Puritanism uh, with the stigma of witchcraft and the witch trials, but there is a large literature on it, and uh, we have a lot of it. And a lot of the literature are sermons and homilies, and we have a lot of those. We have tons of those. So, yeah, we're a good place to visit if you're interested in studying 17th century American Puritanism. Uh, priority, uh, let's just see here. D -d 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 -d. Does the original text exist? No, it doesn't. Or if it does, no one's found it. Goodness knows it may be in someone's attic somewhere. I don't know. But this is the only text <clears throat> that has come down to us. It is the text that, it is the source text for everything that you see in print. Um, so that's really, that's really it. Um, a, fair, a fair copy, not the original source. So I see that we are coming to the end of our time. I want to let you get off to business or cocktails. Um, but in closing, um, I wanted to let you know that we will be posting this and all of our Curator Confidential po programs online for you to watch in the future. Look out for more information about that. I want to thank you all for watching this evening, for your attention, your questions, and your membership support. We look forward to having you back here a week from tonight for the next episode of <clears throat> Curator Confidential entitled Women's History in the Age of Epidemic with Valerie Paley, New York S Historical Society's Senior Vice President and Chief Historian and Director of the Center for Women's History. Until then, I thank you, wish you good night.